Good morning and welcome, friends. The lodges all around the world meet on Sundays. This particular one, uh, representing the Washington DC area, meets at 11 a.m. every Sunday for the presentation of a theosophical talk given by a student of theosophy, which is followed by <coughs> questions and answers. On the first and third Sundays of the month, we meet for a round table discussion. At this time, we're studying the Bhagavad Gita and the notes on the Bhagavad Gita. The continuation of the work that um, R.C. reinstated on its um, original lines in 1900s uh, has had a tremendous success in the continuity of the philosophy being presented to the world and for those who need it, especially the Western world. The students of theosophy find tremendous guidance in the declaration of the ULT. The policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement, but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is a dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy <coughs> and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, whenever and wherever situated, is similarity of aim purpose and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution, bylaws, nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis. And it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition or organization, and it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect, yet belongs to each and all. The following is a form signed by associates of the United Lodge of Theosophists. Being in sympathy with the purposes of this lodge, as set forth in its declaration, I hereby record my desire to be enrolled as an associate, it being understood that such association calls for no obligation on my part, other than that which I myself determine. Today's talk comes from the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 8, Devotion to the Omnipresent <coughs> Spirit, named as Om. Arjuna, what is that Brahman? What is Adyatma? And what, O oh best of men, is Karma? What also is Adibhuta? And what Adidaivata? Who too is Adiyajna here in this body? And how therein, O oh slayer of mother? Tell me also how men who are fixed in meditation are to know thee at the hour of death. Krishna. Brahman the Supreme is the exhaustless. Adhyatma is the name of my being manifesting as the individual self. Karma is the emanation which causes the existence and reproduction of creatures. 
Adibuta is the supreme spirit dwelling in all elemental nature through the mysterious power of nature's illusion. Adidaivata is a Prusha, the spiritual person, and Adiyajna is myself in this body, O best of embodied men. Whoever at the hour of death abandoneth the body fixed in meditation upon me, without doubt goeth to me. Whoso in consequence of constant meditation on any particular form thinketh upon it when quitting his mortal shape, even to that doth he go, O son of Kunti. Therefore, at all times, meditate only on me and fight. Thy mind and body being placed on me alone, thou shalt without doubt come to me. The man whose heart abides in me alone, wandering to no other object, shall also by meditation on the Supreme Spirit go to it, O son of Krita. Whosoever shall meditate upon the all wise, which is without beginning, the supreme ruler, the smallest of the small, the supporter of all, whose form is incomprehensible, bright as the sun beyond the darkness, with mind undeviating, united to devotion, and by the power of meditation, concentrated at the hour of death, with his vital powers blazed between the eyebrows, attains to that supreme divine spirit. Today's talk is on aphorisms on karma, and next week's uh, presentation of the uh, program is for uh, commemoration of the centennial departure of RC from this uh, field operation and the influence he exerted on the Theosophical movement. Good morning. The 31 aphorisms that will in part be covered in today's talk first appeared in the March 1893 issue of The Path, penned by Mr. William Q. Judge. This talk will be a synthesis of these aphorisms with Mr. Judge's other articles on karma, along with H. P. Blavatsky's writings on this topic. Mr. Judge prefaces these aphorisms by stating the following quote. The following, among others not yet used, were given to me by teachers, among them being H.P. Blavatsky. Some were written, others communicated in other ways. To me, they were declared to be from manuscripts not now accessible to the general public. Each one was submitted for my judgment and reason, and just as they, aside from any authority, approved themselves to my reason after serious consideration of them, so I hope they will gain the approval of those but my fellow workers, to whom I now publish them. First of all, how does Mr. Judge define karma? He indicates that it is twofold, hidden and manifest. Karma is the man that is. Karma is his action. True that each action is a cause from which evolves the countless ramifications of effect in time and space. Karma, broadly speaking, may be said to be the continuous of the nature of the act and each act contains within itself the past and future. Every defect which can be realized from an act must be implicit in the act itself, or it could never come into existence. Effect is but the nature of the act, and cannot exist distinct from its cause. Karma only produces the manifestation of that which already exists. Being action, it has its operation in time. And karma may therefore be said to be the same action from another point of time. It must, moreover, be evident that not only is there a relation between the cause and the effect, but there must also be a relation between the cause and the individual who experiences the effect. If it were otherwise, any man would reap the effect of the actions of any other man. We may sometimes appear to reap the effects of the action of others, but this is only apparent. In point of fact, it is our own action. These statements are in line with the first two of his aphorisms. One, there is no karma unless there is a being to make it or feel its effects. Two, karma is the adjustment of effects flowing from causes, during which the being upon whom and through whom that adjustment is effected, 
experiences pain or pleasure. On page 302 of Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, HPV states that karma is a word of many meanings and has a special term for almost every one of its as aspects. It means as a synonym of sin, the performance of some action for the attainment of an object of worldly, hence selfish, desire, which cannot fail to be hurtful to somebody else. Karma is action, the cause, and karma again is the law of ethical causation, the effect of an act produced egotistically when the great law of harmony depends on altruism. So we have one of the first definitions here. Law of Ethical Causation. The third aphorism states that karma is an undeviating and unerring tendency in the universe to restore equilibrium, and it operates incessantly. Tied to this statement, when asked if karma is an intelligent law, Madame Blavatsky answers in the following way. For the materialist who calls the law of periodicity, which regulates the marshalling of the several bodies, and all the other laws in nature, blind forces and mechanical laws, no doubt karma would be a law of chance and no more. For us, no adjective or qualification could describe that which is impersonal, and no entity but a universal operative law. If you question me about the causative intelligence in it, I must answer you I do not know. But if you ask me to define its effects and tell, me, and tell you what these are in our belief, I may say that the experience of thousands of ages has shown us that they are absolute and unerring equity, wisdom, and intelligence. So she states its karma's effects are wisdom, intelligence, Karma in its effects is an unfailing redresser of human injustice, and all, all the failures of nature a stern adjuster of wrongs, a retributive law which rewards and punishes with equal impartiality. It is, in the strictest sense, no respecter of persons, though, on the other hand, it can neither be propitiated or appeased, nor turned aside by prayer. She provides a deeper understanding in Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, page 306. This law of retribution, whether conscious or unconscious, predestines nothing and no one. It exists from and in eternity, truly, for it is eternity <coughs> itself. And as such, since no act can be co-equal with eternity, it cannot be said to act, for it is action itself. So she states that karma is eternity itself. And these are all caps in Secret Doctrine. And also she says it's action itself. It is not the wave which drowns a man, but the personal action of the wretch who goes deliberately and places himself under the impersonal action of the laws that govern the ocean's motion. Karma creates nothing, nor, nor does it design. It creates nothing, nor it does. It is man who plans and creates causes, and karmic law adjusts the effects, which adjustment is not an act but universal harmony, tending ever to resume its original position, like a bow 
which bent down too forcibly rebounds with corresponding vigor. If it happens to dislocate the arm, try to bend it out of its natural position, shall we say that it is the bow which broke our arm, or that our own folly has brought us to grief? Karma has never sought to destroy intellectual and individual liberty, like the god invented by the monotheists. It has not involved its decrees in darkness purposely to perplex man, nor shall it punish him who dares to scrutinize its mysteries. On the contrary, he who unveils through study and meditation its in intricate paths and throws light on those dark ways in the windings of which so many men perish along, owing to their ignorance of the labyrinth of life is working for the good of his fellow man. Karma is an absolute and eternal law in the world of manifestation, and as there can only be one absolute, as one eternal ever-present cause, believers in karma cannot be regarded as atheists or materialists, still less as fatalists, for karma is one with the unknowable, of which it is an aspect in its effects in the phenomenal world. So she says it's an aspect of the unknowable. You might want to put the C at the, bed, at the beginning of Creator. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Judge, in his fifth aphorism, discusses karma's all-encompassing effects in the phenomenal world by stating, Karma oper operates on all things and beings from the minutest conceivable atom up to Brahma. Proceeding in the three worlds of men, gods, and the elemental beings, no spot in the manifested universe is exempt from its sway. Writings in the Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, page 635, shed further light on this. It states, at the first flutter of renascent life, Svab Havat, the mutable radiance of the immutable darkness, unconscious in eternity, passes at every new rebirth of cosmos, from an inactive state into one of intense activity, that it differentiates, and then begins <coughs> its work through that differentiation. This work is karma. So we have another definition. work through differentiation. The cycles are also subservient to the effects produced by this activity. The one cosmic atom becomes seven atoms on the plane of matter, and each is transformed into a center of energy. That same atom becomes seven rays on the plane of spirit, and seven creative forces of nature radiating from the root essence. Follow one the right, the other the left path, separate till the end of the kalpa, and yet are in close embrace. What unites them? Karma. In his ninth aphorism, Mr. Judge states that the karma of this earth is the combination of the acts and thoughts of all beings of every grade which were concerned in the preceding mamantara, or evolutionary stream, from which ours flows. And who records karma? According to secret doctrine, it is the Lipika. Specifically, it states the following. The Lipika are the spirits of the universe, whereas the builders are only our own planetary deities. The former belong to the most occult portion of cosmogenesis, which cannot be given here. Of its highest grade, one thing only is taught. The Deepika are connected with karma, being its direct recorders. Deepika, direct recorders of karma. <clears throat> 
Mr. Judge states that the first great result of karmic action is the incarnation in physical life. The birth-seeking entity, consisting of desires and tendencies, presses forward towards incarnation. It is governed in the selection of its scene of manifestation by the law of economy. And Mr. Judge uses this term a few times when talking about karma, law of economy. Whatever is the ruling tendency, that is to say, whatever group of affinities is strongest, those affinities will lead it to the point of manifestation, at which there is the least opposition. It in incarnates in those surroundings most in harmony with its karmic tendencies, and all the effects of actions contained in the karma so manifesting will be experienced by the individual. This governs the station of life, the sex, the conditions of the irresponsible years of childhood, the con constitution with the various diseases inherent in it, and in fact all those determining forces of physical existence, which are ordinarily classed under the terms heredity and national characteristics. But can man's acts and thoughts have an effect in his destiny? Mr. Judge shows that this is the case in Aphorism 13. The effects may be counteracted or mitigated by the thoughts and acts of oneself or of another, and then the resulting effects represent the combination and interaction of the whole number of causes involved in producing the effects. And HPV eloquently describes this in the following way. This is secret doctrine. <laughs> Those who believe in karma have to be believe in destiny, which from birth to death, Every man is weaving thread by thread around himself, as a spider does his cobweb. And this destiny is guided either by the heavenly voice of the invisible prototype outside of us, or by our more intimate astral, or inner man, who is but too often the evil genius of the embodied entity called man. Both these lead on the outward man, but one of them must prevail. And from the very beginning of the invisible affray, the stern and implacable law of compensa compensation steps in and takes its course, faithfully following the fluctuations. When the last strand is woven and man is seemingly enwrapped in the network of his own doing, then he finds himself completely under the empire of, of this self-made destiny. It then either fixes him like the inert shell against the immo immovable rock or carries him away like a feather in a whirlwind made by his own actions. And this is karma. How about karma acting on higher levels of races and nations? Aphorism 14 and 15 provide insight into this. 14 states that in the life of worlds, races, nations, and individuals, karma cannot act unless there's an appropriate instrument provided for its action. And 15 states, and until such appropriate instrument is found, that karma related to it remains unexpended. Mr. Judge Mr. Judge's article on karma <coughs> provides additional details on this. He states that it is really the law of economy, which is the truth underlying these terms and which explains them. <coughs> Take, for instance, a nation with certain special characteristics. These are the plane of expansion for any entity whose greatest number of affinities are in harmony with those characteristics. The incoming entity following the law of least resistance becomes incarnated in that nation. And all karmic effects following such characteristics will accrue to the individual. This will explain what is the meaning of such expressions as the karma of nations. And what is true of the nation will also apply to my to family and caste. It must, however, be remembered that there are many tendencies which are not exhausted in the act of incarnation. It may happen that the karma which caused an entity to incarnate in any particular surrounding was only strong enough to carry it into physical existence. Being exhausted in that direction, freedom is obtained for the manifestation of other tendencies and their karmic effects. For instance, karmic force may cause an entity to incarnate in a humble sphere, sphere of life, he may be born as the child of poor parents. The karma follows the entity, endures for a longer or shorter time, and becomes exhausted. From that point, the child takes a line of life totally different from his surroundings. Other affinities engendered by former action expresses themselves in their karmic results. 
the lingering effect of the past karma may still manifest itself in the way of obstacles and obstructions which have surmounted with varying degrees of success according to their intensity. If we move on to aphorism 17, it states the following. The appropriateness of an instrument for the operation of karma consists in the exact connection and relation of the karma with the body, mind, intellectual, and psychical nature acquired for use by the ego in any life. And Mr. Judge expands on this in the following way. It has been said that karma is the continuous of the act, and for any particular line of karma to exert itself, it is necessary that there should be the basis of the act engendering that karma, in which it can inhere and operate. But action has many planes in which it can inhere. There is a physical plane, the body with its senses and organs, then there is the intellectual plane, memory which binds the impressions of the senses into a consecutive whole, and reason puts in an orderly arrangement, its storehouse of facts. Beyond the plane of intellect, there is a plane of emotion, the plane of preference for one object rather than another, the fourth principle of the man. These three, physical, intellectual, and emotional, deal entirely with objects of sense perception and may be called the great battlefield of karma. Mr. Judge states that the great battlefield of karma is in the plains of So it's emotional, intelligence, and physical planes. I'm sorry, this is intellectual. <coughs> there is also the plane of ethics, the plane of discrimination, of the I ought to do this, I ought not to do that. This plane harmonizes the intellect and the emotions. So he states that. Ethics harmonizes emotional and intellectual planes. All these are the planes of karma or action, what to do and what not to do. It is the mind as the basis of desire that initiates action on the various planes. And, it's, and it is only through the mind that the effects of rest and action can be received. In Aphorism 23, Mr. Judge provides a similar delinea delineation by stating the three fields of operation are, are used in each being by karma. A. The body and the circumstances. The B, B. The mind and intellect. C. The psychic and astral planes. And he provides further ex explanation as to how mind plays an important role in affecting his karma. The law of karma is not fatalism, and the little consideration will show that it is possible for an individual to affect his own karma. If a greater amount of energy be taken up on one plane than another, on another, this will cause the past karma to unfold itself on that plane. For instance, one who lives entirely on the plane of sense gratification will from the plane beyond draw the energy required for the fulfillment of his desires. Let us illustrate by dividing man into upper and lower nature, as we frequently do, do in theosophy. By directing the mind and aspirations to the lower plane, a fire or center of attraction is set up there. And in order to feed and fatten it, the energies of the whole upper plane are drawn down and exhausted in supplying the need of energy which exists below due to the indulgence of sense gratification. On the other hand, the center of attraction may be fixed in the upper portion, and then all the needed energy goes there. To result in increase of spirituality. It must be remembered that nature is all bountiful and withholds not her hand. The demand is made and the supply will come. But at what cost? That energy which should have strengthened the moral nature and fulfilled the aspirations after good 
is drawn to the lower desires. By degrees, the higher planes are exhausted of vitality, and the good and bad karma of an entity will be absorbed on the physical plane. If, on the other hand, the interest is detached from the plane of sense gratification, if there is a constant effort to fix the mind on the attainment of the highest ideal, the result will be that past karma will find no basis in which to inhere on the physical plane. Karma will therefore be manifested only in harmony with the plane of desire. The sense energy of the physical plane will exhaust itself on a higher plane, and thus become transmuted in its effects. In continuation of this line of thought, the aphorism 19 states that change may, changes may occur in the instrument during one life so as to make it appropriate for a new class of karma, and this may take place in two ways, a through intensity of thought and the power of a vow, and b through natural alterations due to complete exhaustion of old causes. What are the means through which the effects of karma can be changed? A person can have no attachment for a thing he does not think about. Therefore, the first step must be to fix the thought on the highest ideal. In this connection, one remark may be made on the subject of repentance. Repentance is a form of, of a thought in which the mind is constantly recurring to a sin. It has therefore to be avoided if one would set the mind free from sin and its karmic results. All sin has its origin in the mind. The more the mind dwells on any course of conduct, whether with pleasure or pain, the less chance is there for it to become detached from such action. The manas, or mind, is the knot of the heart. When that is untied from any object, in other words, when the mind loses its interest in any object, there will no longer be a link between the karma connected with that object and the individual. It is the attitude of the mind which draws the karmic cords tightly around the soul. It imprisons the aspirations and binds them with chains of difficulty and obstruction. It is desire that causes the past karma to take form and shape and build the house of clay. It must be through non-attachment that the soul will burst through the walls of pain. It will be only through a change of mind that the karmic burden will be lifted. So, there's a need to practice non-attachment and a change of mind. It will appear, therefore, that although absolutely true that action brings its own result, there is no destruction here of actions good or not good. Coming to one body after another, they become ripened in their respective ways. Yet this ripening is the act of the individual. Free will of man asserts itself and he becomes his own savior. To the worldly man, karma is a stern nemesis. To the spiritual man, karma unfolds itself in harmony with his highest aspirations. He will look with tranquility alike on past and future, neither dwelling with remorse on past sin nor living in expectation of reward for present action. In Aphorism 22, Mr. Judge indicates that karma is of three sorts. A. Presently operative in this life through the appropriate instruments. B. That which is being made or stored up to be exhausted in the future. And C. Karma held over from past life or lives, and not operating yet because inhibited by inappropriateness of the instrument in use by the ego, or by the force of karma now operating. In Hinduism, these three <coughs> divisions are, of karma are called Sanchita karma, Prarabdha karma, and Agami karma, also known as Kriyamana and Vartamana. So, we should put these up here. Three types of karma. Can you 
please insert the source for that, where that came from. Um, I, I don't have it in my notes, uh, but I'll provide it. It's Mr. Judge's art article, I think, where it's from Theosophical Moment. Um, a person's Sanchita karma is their karmic account, <coughs> or karmic reservoir, the, store the storehouse of all their karma from past lives that has not yet been dealt with. Prarabdha karma is the specific portion of that Sanchita karma, which the person is destined to face and experience in the present lifetime. If successfully dealt with, that portion of their karma will then be exhausted and wiped out. Agami karma is the fresh karma we are creating for ourselves, right here and right now, as we live in the present lifetime. It becomes added to our Sanchita karma and will manifest itself as our Prarabdha karma in future lifetimes. If we combine aphorisms 25 and 26, they state the following. Birth into any sort of body and to obtain the fruits of any sort of karma is due to the preponderance of the line of karmic tendency. The sway of karmic tendency will influence the incarnation of an ego or any family of egos for three lives at least, when measures of repression, elimination, or counteraction are not adopted. To give additional insight as to how karma influences a person life after life, let us reflect on the following occult teaching. Karma, Tanha, and Skandhas are the almighty trinity in one and the cause of our rebirth. The illustration of painting our own present likeness at death, and that likeness becoming the future personality is very poetical and graphic, but we claim it as an occult teaching. At the solemn moment of death, no man can fail to see himself under his true colors, and no self-deception is of any use to him any longer. Thence the following thing happens. As at the instant of drowning, man sees Marshall past his mind's eye the whole of his life, with all its events, effects and causes, to the minute, minutest details, so at the moment of death, he sees himself in all his moral nakedness unadorned by either human flattery or self-adulation, and as he is, hence, as he or rather, as his astral double combined with his common principle shall be. For the vices, defects, and especially the passions of the preceding life become, through certain laws of affinity and transference, the germs of the future potentialities in the animal soul, Kamarupa, hence of its dependent, the astral double, Linga Sharira, at a subsequent birth. It is the personality alone which changes. The real reincarnating principle, the ego, remains always the same. And it is its karma that guides the idiosyncrasies and prominent moral traits of the old personality that was, and that the ego knew not how to control, to reappear in the new man that will be. These traits and passions pursue and fasten on the yet plastic third and fourth principles of the child, and unless the ego struggles and conquers, they will develop with tenfold intensity and lead the adult man to his destruction. For it is they who are the tools and weapons of karmic law of retribution. Thus, the prince says very truly that our good and bad actions are the only tools with which we paint our likeness at death. For the new man is invariably the son, of, son and progeny of the old man that was. In his book, Ocean of Theosophy, Mr. Judge sums up that the science, scientific and self-compelling basis for right ethics is found in these and in no other doctrines. For if right ethics are to be practiced merely for themselves, men will not see why, and have never been able to see why, for that reason that they should do right. If ethics are to be followed from fear, man is degraded and will surely evade. If the favor of the Almighty, not based on law or justice, be the reason, then we will have just what prevails today. A code given by Jesus to the West professed by nations and not practiced, save by the few, who would in any case be virtuous. On this subject, the adepts had written the following to be found in the secret doctrine. Nor would the ways of karma be inscrutable were men to work in union and harmony instead of disunion and strife. For our ignorance of those ways, which one portion of mankind calls the way of providence, dark and intricate, while another sees in them the action of blind fatalism, 
and a third simple chance, with neither gods nor devils to guide them, would surely disappear, if we would but attribute all these to their correct cause. With right knowledge, or at any rate with a confident conviction, that our neighbors will no more work to hurt us than we would think of harming them, the two-thirds of the world's evil would vanish into thin air. Were no man to hurt his brother, common nemesis would have neither cause to work for nor weapons to act through. We cut these numerous windings in our destinies daily with our own hands. While we imagine that we are pursuing a track on the royal high road of respectability and duty, and then complain of those ways being so intricate and so dark. We stand bewildered before the mystery of our own making and the riddles of life that we will not solve, and then accuse the great sphinx of, our, of devouring us. But verily, there's an accident, there's not an accident in our lives, not a misshapen day or a misfortune that could not be traced back to our own doings in this or in another life. So this brings us to the end of our my prepared remarks, the floor is now open for questions. Please. <laughs> Please. Okay. Outside of the Theosophy circles, people think of karma as punishment. What can you say to them uh, to make them understand that also whatever good is happening to them is their own doing? What, what words would you use? Um, so, uh, this presentation earlier, we talked about karma being impersonal. It's, uh, it's a law of retribution, and the objective is to bring in universal harmony. Mm -hmm. So, um, punishment in the sense that uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we mentioned that anything that's selfish, you know, um, worldly, that will have its effects in terms of karma. Um, so, if you are acting selfishly, then uh, there will be a price to pay in that sense. So, that will be quote-unquote punishment. And that is your sin, uh, based on the stu student's understanding. So um, the universe, karma, will bring it to alignment with universal harmony. And until that happens, you will be quote-unquote punished. But that's not a person or an entity punishing you. It's the universal law um, that is harmonizing the universe and you, so that you act in accordance with, uh, with the rest of, of the world. So, um, that's what I can say on that. You, Mr. Judge said, in our belief, which struck me to the core almost, because Mr. Judge is the most advanced being, that I never run into any, any that are as advanced as him. He, uh, and then he said, in our belief, which tells me that we always have to have faith, and belief, but it's got to be based on knowledge, and that's where we're working to, to attain this kind of knowledge that he obviously came in with, and he actually gained control over his sickly little boy body because of that will that he had and all of this, this that he came in with in prior lives, which tells me that this philosophy is very deep and it's very applicable to all of us because any of us could do that. Yes. And if this little guy could have done it, who, who, who? Yes, he's a great you know? example. And he, I put up uh, two things, non-attachment and change of mind. And uh, we read a portion of his article on karma again, and how we should focus our attention, our mind, to the higher plane. And by doing so, the lower plane uh, will be transmuted. All of our karma on the lower plane will be transmuted into higher planes. And as you said, he's a great... Uh, example of how a student should be living his or her life and um, he wasn't seeking uh, results and we are constantly being told in these teachings that we should not be focused on goals or anything it should, it should be our daily uh, living that should be um, the example for our own selves you know um, so um, I see him as a great uh, person that did that Please. He also said unknowable, and uh, <clears throat> it, but he said in its effects on the phenomenal world. Right. So 
there was a qualifier there. So, is anything unknowable? Is anything unknowable? Yeah. Uh, well, in this philosophy, deity, uh, the absolute all, the highest, is the unknowable. Level. Yes, yes. So, uh, we cannot even imagine or think about uh, a deity. Uh, here we use the term deity because God mm -hmm. has been uh, used in religions in a different way, so as to not confuse us. But deity equals absolute all. Um, uh, and there's various other terminology which uh, I won't go into, but. Um, here we stated that karma is uh, an effect of the unknowable in the phenomenal world. Gotcha. But that's again, deity is unknowable all in the phenomenal world. But we can get very close to that in terms of growth. Yes, yes. Um, but beyond that, uh, we, I mean, uh, this. We cannot conceive of uh, it says one any step removed. We, one we step can get removed. one step removed from the absolute. Yes. Please. But uh, the secret doctrine just states that we are one with the absolute. So uh, I'm not quite sure I go along with this statement. What is explained in the secret doctrine is that for the human mind is limited. For a limited human mind, uh, it is very difficult to understand absolute because you're only part of that absolute. Everything in the universe makes that absolute in its totality. So for a portion to be able to perceive the absolute, she said it is impossible. But when you're not in a physical body and you are living in your spiritual life, mm -hmm. in other words, in those higher essences, you come very close to perceiving it. You, you want will in that. Well, you are one with it, yeah. but you're still part of it because you still keep your individuality. Mm -hmm. However, you can perceive the all better in that condition when you're perfected than uh, us working to become uh, initiated into the total mystery because we are partial at this time. Please. In regard to the student's question earlier, about punishment. Um, this student does not have any concept of punishment in this philosophy because <coughs> if we are concerned about, <coughs> excuse me, um, establishing harmony, when we, through our disorganization, interrupt that harmony, I think how we need to look at it as is. Uh, nature gives us a chance to work our karmic debt to whatever plane of existence it is owed and bring that harmony back into existence because when you disharmonize I think HP begins the example of throwing a stone into the water in a lake mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that eventually it says uh, that it's going to affect the whole lake from shore to shore that all of its molecular constitution is affected. One drop of water being connected to the next drop of water, it eventually goes to the shoreline. So with the human nature, it is, I think, the same thing. Since we are all connected to one another, but not just humanity in itself, but to all of the lower kingdoms of nature, it affects everything. Our disharmonization affects everything. So that is the debt that we have to pay back to um, nature and it is called karmic debt and so I, I don't see any punishment in it but a just um, effect from the cause we created that follows yes you're right and there is a uh, subtle differences and she provides this in uh, secret doctrine uh, volume 2 I'll read a br brief quote um, an occultist or a philosopher will not speak of the goodness or cruelty of providence which he says karma nemesis is the synonym of providence earlier. But identifying it with karma nemesis, he will teach that nevertheless it guards the good and watches over them in this as in future lives, and that it punishes the evildoer, I even to his seventh rebirth. So the way she speaks is, you know, uh, when it's karma nemesis, it's quote unquote uh, punishes, um, uh, but in actuality it's synonym with providence. Um, it's, I mean, very philosophical and deep, so it's hard to just talk, uh, you know, specific as to what she means here. 
but um, yeah, I just want to share that. Well, if we remember that everything is in seven levels, then that knowledge that she's imparting to us can be read in seven different right. ways, yes. on seven different planes of being, and as you go closer to the homogeneous or spiritual aspect of life, it becomes totally removed from the objective world, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, what we have caused is felt right here on this objective field of operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should go on. Um, it says, for the only decree of karma, an eternal Im immutable decree, she says, is absolute harmony in the world of matter as it is in the world of spirit. Mm -hmm. So it is not therefore karma that rewards or punishes, but it is we who reward or punish ourselves according to whether we work with, through, and along with nature abiding by the laws on which that harmony depends or break them. So it's all about harmony. Yeah, it is. And when we learn to live in harmony, then we become harmonious. Yes. We actually, even the environment we are in, and affect everybody around us in that way. But it is easier said than done. Yes. Absolutely. So it says, uh, you know, nature exists for us, for our improvement and so forth. And that's, I mean, that's what we're talking about here, it's karma within nature, I think. And, uh, you should also say we're not uh, separated from nature, we are we nature are, ourselves. We are nature ourselves. We, we do affect nature for the big, yeah, biggest absolutely. picture, because as we grow, nature changes. Yeah, yeah. And we grow by our own self-induced and self-devised methods. We've got to get into it. Only the, only the few are really into it now that we uh, I have heard about. Uh, but that, that has to expand and that will expand. I think that's what the, you know, is that the grand plan? Maybe, and you know, hopefully it, I expect it is. Yeah. It's got to be. Yes, and um, HPV was uh, here to teach this knowledge to us at a certain point of time, at the age of dawn of age of Aquarius. And she initiated the currents, and um, you know we're here to feed off of it, uh, carry it on. So um, we'll see where that takes us. Please. Well, um, it is necessary to keep it going, and because that was what she requested of us, that we not allow her last incarnation to be waste. That um, the line of. Uh, a current not be broken uh, because that um, the spiritual energy obviously flows into our world through it as well as us being able to access it and go to the root it's a two-way road so if we cut it off it takes a tremendous amount of effort to reestablish it until the, whoever is coming into the world if there is a one uh, then he will have to or she will have to re-establish re it but the point of the 21st century is, uh, to the student's understanding from the writings, is that each human soul, which is each of us, uh, needs to become a center mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of knowledge and wisdom for itself. And then uh, the dissemination of it would be a natural process that we should not depend on any authority because each human soul is its own authority. So if this is a 21st century goal we are to accomplish, then it becomes very important to have the original writings and study them mm -hmm. at the same time. Yes. That we know yes. what is real and differentiate it from what is not real. Yes, yes. self-reliance is very important, absolutely. Uh, Self-dependency, the Buddha says, is bliss and other dependency is misery, <laughs> which I like extremely right. well. Yes, we also say from within outwards it needs to go, so. Yeah, well it goes both ways. Yeah. Peripherals yeah. in and center yeah. out. Uh, Feeds out of each other both ways. Yeah, but it has to be balanced for us to be able to live, absolutely. Any other? Please. If somebody else, just to follow up on, I was thinking about Mr. Judge and he, he obviously when he, when he came in from that prior life into that sickly body. He had con he, he gained control over that body at least for a while to get this job done. Um, and uh, so it translates 
to physical. All of this trans comes to this plane in more than yes. one way. Yes, and as he said, it transmutes the physical plane. If you live on the higher planes, it will uh, affect the kar your karmic tendencies in this physical plane as well. And spiritual thinking is different. Oh, go ahead. If somebody else has something. It said that, uh, you know, when you transform to that plane, a way of thinking is way different than this. And, for example, uh, we as individuals can do something just as important as the ruler of the world, the president, or something like that, simply by picking up a banana peel to prevent someone from falling. That counts just as much as a major world policy development. You're right. I mean, we're all connected and everything affects everything else, so um, that makes sense. Please. Can you please uh, specify what those Sanskrit terms stand for? Um, I, I think it's... Um, I'll, I'll do it again. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't want to stay. Uh, so, Sanchita Karma, is there a karmic account, karmic reservoir? Karmic reservoir? And after uh, the lecture, we can go and refer to the article. As I said, it was, I think, from Theosophical Movement. Um, it's the storehouse of all their karma from past lives that has not yet been dealt with. Prarabdha, prarabdha karma is the specific portion of that Sanchita karma which the person is destined to face and experience in the present lifetime. Can you at least put present life next to it? Sure. Part. <coughs> it's part of that karma, but it is also this present life, present existence, whatever you want to do, so people can understand it. I say part of Sanchita karma will be faced in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And Agami? And Agami uh, karma is the fresh karma that we are creating for ourselves right here and now. Okay. Um, so. So, you know, when you look at that, here is what you could not expand in all the. I think it might go two, three backwards. I'm not quite sure how many it goes, but I think I have three. three lives. Yeah. It goes three backwards. So we're bringing uh, all of it with us, but it is a determined portion that we're going to work on in this life because it's dependent on the physical body, the mind, uh, your environment, yes. uh, your opportunities. And then, of course, as you're living through in this incarnation, you're expanding those, and from your explanation, I think you said that if you are thinking on the higher planes, mm -hmm. then you're transmuting that onto yes. higher planes, and it will not come come back to you exhaust because itself. you're yes. exhausting it on the physical plane. But the last one, the agami, then is what we are doing, and of course we make errors as we are going along. We yes. don't know exactly what to do yes. sometimes. So obviously we're also accumulating fresh karma, right. which it will show itself perhaps in the future lives. Thank you. Okay, oh, please. Yes, sir. Uh, question. After the call, when you look up the source of mm -hmm. that um, bit Three times. on the board, could you please write it on the board? Sure. And then we'll take a picture we'll of it, it so it will go online. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next week. For ULT Day. For ULT Day, yes. Thank you.